Hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Stewart. I work at the OI Foundation as the Director of Education. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking uh, with some of our doctors on our Medical Advisory Council about preparing for telehealth and tele or telemedicine visits. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. We're gonna wait for a few more people, a few uh, late stragglers to join us so they don't miss anything. Um, if you're joining us, you'll notice that we have muted your microphones. Uh, if you have questions or comments for the group, we ask, we invite you, please type them into the chat feed, uh, the chat bar below. Um, type in to everyone so you can see uh, where that is. Uh, during today's session, we expect it to run approximately one hour long, give or take. If you have questions at any point, feel free to type them in and we will try to get to them in a uh, first come, first serve basis. Uh, today's session, I think, is gonna be really informative, really interesting, uh, something that we have, I personally have lots of questions about and our doctors have lots of knowledge and experience doing. So we're gonna wait, I think, just a few more minutes before I hand off the uh, quote unquote microphone to Tracy Hart. <laughs> and you know what it looks like we are pretty solid uh tracy do you want to uh, kick us off sure hi everybody um i'm tracy hart i'm the ceo of the oi foundation welcome welcome to the session tonight really excited about it um and i would like to thank uh, dr reed sutton and dr laura tosi for being our presenters tonight uh, both are members of our medical advisory council and uh, they will introduce themselves a little bit just to tell you a little bit more about who they are as, as they start their presentation. Um, but I did want to just note, I see Dr. Glorio is uh, in the session tonight. And um, I think many of you know Dr. Glorio. He is the chairperson of our Medical Advisory Council at the OI Foundation and a member of our board of directors, um, as Dr. Tosi is a member of our board of directors as well. So, um, so glad to see familiar faces and I see Jeffrey Esslinger, all the way from Hawaii, if you're in Hawaii, so this is very exciting. Um, so glad you're all with us. So I'm going to turn it over now. Uh, Michael, am I turning it over to Dr. Tosi or back to you? Actually, I have uh, one more quick announcement, so sure. thank you for that. Um, so I want to ask though, we are actually using a new closed captioning software for this session. So uh, for anyone who would like to use closed captioning, you can go to the closed caption button on your screen and then go to show subtitles. So we are using a new software. We're uh, testing it out for today. So please, if you uh, want to use that, that is there for you. And if you have questions or feedback about our closed captioning in particular, definitely let us know. We want to hear it. So thank you all. So I think with that being said, I think we're, uh, do we have a, uh, I think, is it going to be Dr. Tosi who's going to kick us off? Uh, sure. So, Dr. Tosi, I'm going to uh, give it to you, and if you'd like to introduce yourself and start us off. Sure. Um, good evening to those of you I don't know. Um, I'm Laura Tosi. I'm a pediatric orthopod at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Um, I have to disagree with Michael and Tracy. Incredibly, I have no claims to being an expert on telemedicine, like many of you. Um, I had was forced uh, to start learning about this just three months ago. Um, my great memory is first weekend of March, Tracy and I were in Phoenix, Michael as well, for one of the, Tracy's wonderful regional meetings. As I landed and checked my email, my hospital said I couldn't travel anymore. And here I was in Phoenix. How was I going to get home? What? They did let me back, however. But I think life has changed for all of us and we're needing to learn new tricks. And I'm just gonna emphasize briefly some of the things that have been important to me as an orthopod. I have disclosures, none of them relevant to this talk. So I've really already mentioned the extraordinary pivot towards telehealth and video consults um, for 
the end of March and the first half of April, we really did not go into the building. And only now are we starting to see patients, but because of social distancing, my, my in-person visits are cut to about a third um, because we wanna be sure that we're providing social distancing for folks in the waiting room. So I'm really talking about the perils of Pauline um, and things that I wish would go a little bit better. One of our challenges has been people don't always have adequate preparation for the technology. Please, before a visit, check your internet connection and close everything uh, in terms of apps uh, and other uh, issues that you can close down so you have adequate power and nothing is interfering with our relationship. Please be close to your router so that it doesn't shut down in the middle of things. Sometimes headphones work, sometimes they don't. Volume, be sure I can hear you. Sometimes folks have their volume turned way down. Whoops. And um, um, it, for the orthopod, the phone and the tablet um, are handy because I'm trying to watch kids walk. And when parents are trying to carry around a laptop, it can be very problematic. Think about your visit ahead of time and if possible, make a list of your concerns and questions. And please have a notebook ready to write down what I say, just in case we have a failure of communication. Um, please know your meds, not so often important for the orthopod, um, but often I need to know who your specialists are outside of orthopedics, or for me, outside of the children's hospital. And it's really handy if we don't go through, well, I think I remember the name, but please try to think about everyone you want me to communicate with before we start. One of the other challenges I've faced whoops, is that parents have put their children down for a nap. Well, that doesn't work when I need them to walk. Uh, and, and so please think about rearranging the nap time if that's relevant. Other key issues. When was your wheelchair last replaced or braces last replaced? These are um, important in terms of when we can help people get new things. And of course, when with a child was the last bisphosphonate infusion. Handy to have these dates ready. Plan your wardrobe and your space. Um, uh, be in a well-lighted spot, obviously. And if humanly possible, please have another adult engaged in the visit so that you as a parent can um, be holding on to a computer or whatever you need to follow a child walking, bending over. Uh, someone else needs to be the photographer, if, if at all possible, rather than the parent. Please wear shorts um, and preferably a sleeveless blouse or shirt um, because as an orthopod, again, I'm the auto mechanic. I need to see how things are working. And even though it's imperfect, I do want to try to review uh, all relevant equipment, braces, wheelchairs, standers, you name it. And it's handy if they can be in the room. Be sure that you and I come to a decision as to what the next steps will be. Do I need to send a prescription to the pharmacy, brace maker, physical therapist? And interestingly enough for us, perhaps the greatest complication is the follow-up visit. Um, who's going to make that? And our hospital um, ignored our, com our computer requests for visits for a long time and parents have had to call back. We don't want anyone to be lost in the shuffle. So in case you have a free moment, Michael referred me to this extraordinary article that summarizes um, uh, the promise, oops, I can't even see the whole thing, uh, promise and the peril of virtual healthcare uh, that was just um, uh, published. I think it, it's a great article and I'm really having a hard time with my slides. Michael, can you, whoops. Um, um, and free on the internet, um, uh, you just need to go to Google 
as an incredibly interesting article written before the pandemic, trying to help doctors do a better job at these telemedicine visits. And as much as possible, I would urge you to have this as an expectation um, that, that your doctor will be prepared, listen to you intently, be sure that you guys agree on what matters most, be sure that they're connecting with your carefully thought out issues um, and, and that they're listening to what you care about most. Uh, a, a terrific article, not an easy read. So I cannot believe how quickly this ocean liner turned around so very, very quickly. Um, but I think that telemedicine is here to stay. And it's exciting that Seema Verma, the head of CMS, who by CMS rules was not paying for more than a handful of tel telemedicine visits just three months ago, has said publicly, I think the genie's out of the bottle on this one. I think it's fair to say that the advent of telehealth has been just completely accelerated, that it's taken this crisis to push us to a new frontier, but there's absolutely no going back. And that's absolutely true. I care uh, for a number of severely immunocompromised oh, young people, and we want to keep them safe. We want to minimize their trips to the hospital, and we don't need to be quite as intense as we've been in the past. So just a couple of notes from orthopedics, and now I will turn it over to the good Dr. Sutton. Thank you, Laura. Um, and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, as Laura mentioned, um, I'm a medical geneticist at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Um, and so mainly in, involved in the medical or non-surgical management of uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. Again, no relevant disclosures. Um, just a couple of things here in regards to kind of vi like video versus in person. So at our institution, um, we're about half and half at this point, um, in person versus video visits. And so a lot of times um, uh, we will uh, offer individuals one or the other. Um, and so I think it's important to think about kind of what sort of visit that you want, if that uh, uh, is an offering. Um, I would say that I think, you know, while I don't by any means want to minimize the uh, risk of exposure to COVID-19 or, or the uh, gravity of the pandemic, um, I, I do think that, you know, our hospital, and I'm sure um, most hospitals that people would be going to for their OI care, um, uh, have implemented like very intensive kind of social distancing as well as uh, protect other protective activities in order to really limit the spread of uh, virus transmission. And so I think, um, you know, if you really feel like that you do need an in-person visit, I think that again, um, most hospitals are taking a lot of significant safety measures to ensure that uh, for people who do really need to come for an in-person visit, that that's really safe for them. <clears throat> um, I think as far as kind of picking, I think, you know, if um, you're an individual who, uh, you know, you're having just kind of a routine healthcare visit with your OI doctor and you feel like you're generally either doing well or there aren't any sort of big changes to things that have been going on, a video visit is a, a great option. Uh, or if you're an individual um, for whom management decisions are mainly based upon kind of, you know, what you're telling your doctor during the history part of the visit, or um, if decisions are based mainly upon test results like laboratory results or DEXA scan results or x-ray results, as opposed to kind of physical exam findings, then again, those sorts of visits are really very amenable to being done by video as opposed to an in-person visit. When you want really an in-person visit, um, 
is when you want something really very specific on physical exam that you want the doctor to take a look at. As Dr. Tosi said, the video capabilities generally are pretty good for lots of different devices, but often if there's something that a physician needs to kind of feel to really kind of understand what's going on, that um, that sometimes can be really challenging to assess um, in, a, in a video visit. Um, Dr. Tosi mentioned walking. I think again, you know, certainly that some of that can be done by video, um, and she's more expert than I, but sometimes if I'm kind of concerned, I feel like it's a little challenging to kind of understand that uh, often on videos. Um, and then if you are uh, uh, have um, issues at home with kind of uh, video connections, whether that's limitations of hardware or limitations of internet service, then again, a, a, uh, in-person visit is probably going to be better than the, the video visit. Um, in preparing for the telehealth visit, again, kind of testing whatever device you're going to use to ensure that kind of sound and camera are good. Uh, if it's children, again, for medications, uh, a lot of times those are weight, uh, dosing is weight-based or uh, in general, in children, we want to be sure that they're growing well, and so getting a height and weight before the clinic visit um, uh, to uh, let us know is, is very helpful. Preparing a list of questions or issues that you have that you want to address. Um, my institution uses an electronic health record known as EPIC that has a function called MyChart. This actually allows parents to upload photos of things, and whether that's photos of the child or individual with OI, or photos of like any sort of lab test results or other things into the electronic health record. We find that very helpful to us to be able to view those kind of before or right at the time of the visit. Um, um, and again, um, if you don't have that option, but do have test results, let's say from another doctor or healthcare provider, particularly ones that you want to discuss with your OI specialist doctor, uh, again, kind of sending those records in advance for review is, is helpful. During the visit, again, kind of signing on a, a bit early just to be sure that everything is working okay. Um, Dr. Tosi mentioned kind of that she likes the uh, smartphone or tablet to be able to see walking. Um, I, we often find, particularly if people are on smartphones, that in order to kind of see us, what they wind up doing is getting about this close, and so all we can see is like a little portion of them, which, which is challenging. Um, and so in some, in, like, in some instances, I, I find laptops um, or computers at home with a camera to be a little bit better. Again, having any medications readily available so that you can look at uh, doses or refills that you have left. Again, as Dr. Tosi mentioned, wearing clothing that is conducive to being able to kind of show doc your doctor something um, uh, during the evaluation portion. And again, as Dr. Tosi had mentioned, um, uh, having your child available if it's the child's visit. And then again, uh, being sure you understand what the next steps are. Um, uh, again, in our health record, uh, this MyChart function allows us to uh, prepare a written after visit summary that's visible to patients. But again, asking your doctor if you if you don't know kind of what's available uh, uh, in the wrap up portion um, to for you to view uh, or how they're going to communicate that to you, uh, asking for any sorts of lab orders, letters, or refills that you need. And then again, I know many individuals um, with OI get their specialty care quite a distance, maybe from where they live. Uh, and so um, uh, if it is a video visit, again, asking uh, if there are tests like laboratory tests, x-rays, bone density evaluations, uh, whether those uh, can be done at a, a site closer to home as opposed to needing to come to the specialty center. Um, so uh, thanks, and I think Michael has a bunch of questions that he's uh, prepared for us. Great. So thank you all so much. Uh, Dr. Tosi, I'm going to put you off of uh, sharing your screen real quick. 
Um, so uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for uh, your presentations just now. Those were very informative. So again, to any of our audience members, if you have questions, go ahead and type those right into the chat now and we will get to them, I promise. So I want to jump into some questions that I had uh, thought of before this. So my first one is about, um, so many people with OI, they will see their specialist, as Dr. Sutton said, uh, like they don't live close to them. Often they live out of state. And how do, uh, is the procedure for doing telemedicine or telehealth visits with your out of state doctor, is that different than if they were down the road? Right, I think for, I think Laura's gonna have a very good different perspective than I, I have. Um, so, you know, we have patients, uh, so I'm in Texas, we may have patients that come um, from outside the state. Um, we have a fair number of patients that come from Louisiana and we have um, an agreement with Louisiana temporarily um, to provide telehealth services to um, Louisiana um, patients. Um, but I'm only licensed in the state of Texas. I'm not, don't have a medical license in Louisiana or let's say Oklahoma or other kind of adjacent or near states. And so um, that could be a potential uh, concern if people are traveling across state lines, that it may be that their insurance um, would not cover a telehealth visit for their doctor there. Yes, we face the same problem. I went into this already licensed in Maryland, Virginia, and DC, but in fact, we cover a number of patients from West Virginia as well. And we're not allowed to bill if we've done a telemedicine visit into a state that we're not licensed. Now, the beauty is West Virginia issued me a license in 24 hours, um, which, of course, is unheard of, uh, but has been one of the responses, that they have this eased um, opportunity for expedited review. It will end once they um, change the rules for COVID. Tracy has brought up many times, and I don't know what the future will be, what is the opportunity for folks with OI to get telemedicine visits with people far further afield? Um, and all I can say is that for right now, I can only um, consult if the individual is sitting in a state where I have a license. Stay tuned, that may all change. That's interesting. That's interesting to hear. Um, it's also fascinating to see that you're talking about how the there is a relaxing of the approval process to get that reciprocity. So that is good to hear. So it sounds like this is something that if you have questions, you should probably be reaching out to your individual doctors beforehand. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. But but I think Michael, it's important to note too that as Laura as Laura brought up, you know, these are these are only temporary, and we don't know <laughs> right. how. Like, so again, for us, Louisiana, it's kind of a month by month basis. So it, ours was going to expire kind of the initial approval, the end of May, and then they extended it to the end of June. But, you know, obviously we're about five days from the end of June and we've not heard again if they're going to uh, extend that or not. So, yeah, I think, like you said, just um, individuals with OI kind of communicating with if they have doctors across state lines with them to try to figure out uh, what's possible. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, another type of question I have has to do with, I apologize, I realize the, I am in front of my window and a cloud just went in front of the sky and I look like I'm in a total dark cave. I apologize, everyone. Uh, so I have another question around types of software. So both of you talked about your preferred sets of hardware. So, you know, uh, whether it be talking about, I think it sounds also like the, the type of medical appointment impacts the type of so, uh, hardware you want to use, but also what about software? Do all hospital systems use a pretty standard, standard set of software? Like, are they all using Zoom? Is it something else? What is the process for logging into your meeting, your meeting like? A Tower of Babel <laughs> would be my quick and dirty answer. I, I am drooling when Dr. Sutton talks about what he has access to, because um, Epic, as you heard him say, allows him to upload photos, all kinds of records. I can't do any of that. 
Um, uh, I, all of our telemedicine visits at my hospital are done via Zoom. And I think Zoom has saved lives because it has allowed me access to people that I would not otherwise have been able to get to. But then I have to transpose everything I've been busily scribbling notes on into the medical records. So in fact, um, a telemedicine, I would argue, is a much bigger burden for me because of the, our record keeping service system than it is for Dr. Sutton. Um, and, and that's an issue for a lot of my colleagues. We love the face-to-face. -face. We love the fact that no one can open the exam room door and say, Dr. Josie, Dr. Josie, I need this, I need that. No, it's a private time with my patients, which I love. But, but the work burden has shifted and it is more difficult for us. Right, and I, I would I agree to some extent that there are you know we we use a, a particular app that's kind of linked. We don't use Zoom that's linked to our electronic health record, um, but again, it, it does pose challenges because individuals have to log on in advance and kind of download that app to their again commute, computer or smartphone or tablet um, to do that. Interesting. Thank you both for that. Um, actually, on that note, actually, uh, we have a typed in question here from Tracy that I think uh, really ties in what they're talking about. What about telephone visits now? So we've talked a bit about, like, uh, it's funny, when we say telemedicine, often I think people are imagining actually like a, what is really like a video conference with your doctor, but what about a telephone visit? Does the procedures change at all? We started, when we started, we tended to do kind of more telephone visits just because of the concern of um, patients or families really having good access to um, the video soft, you know, the internet or software or those sorts of things. Um, we obviously, we kind of, as Dr. Tosi said, we all really like to see our patients and kind of you know, I think, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. We really like to see how they're doing. Um, so um, that's something that we really are kind of have moved away from telephone visits. Um, there is, Dr. Tosi alluded to this issue of um, uh, insurers paying. So uh, there was a change in the rules for Medicare and Medicaid to allow to reimburse for telephone visits again and early in the pandemic i think that's um likely to end very soon um and that they would only probably reimburse for video visits i think i think that's right our hospital discourages it because frankly our hospital like many others uh has faced huge financial losses and it would be unfair not to admit that they can charge more uh, and, and they need for us to help shore up the hospital. Interesting, thank you. Um, another set of questions I have to do, I, 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 I have is around uh, the physical location people should be in for some of these meetings. So we talked about technology, we talked about types of software, but um, so often people, uh, particularly if you're living with your family or you're living, say you're a person living with roommates who aren't your family, or, you know, you think you can get more done not when doing your weekly grocery run, uh, is there a best place to be doing these visits from? Because we know, we all know you can do a video call from anywhere now. I would say I've, I've had some that have done them like pulled over on the side of the road driving in their car <laughs> like not hopefully they pulled over like <laughs> like logging into the video but that's you know I understand that we've all got busy lives but that's a little less than ideal so if you can try to plan to like be at home I think um, as opposed to someplace else is, is helpful I don't know that a particular um, Dr. Tosi had mentioned earlier, kind of you know, just being sure that the, the lighting's adequate to kind of see whatever it is. 
um, the doctor might want to see. But um, again, beyond just kind of being at home or an area where you've got reliable internet access, I think it doesn't matter a lot, probably. Yeah, I too have had the experience when mom's been in the front seat holding up her cell phone so I could see the child in the back seat to see their knee range of motion. Uh, not ideal, but, but we'll take what we can get. Um, uh, but a quiet spot where, the ch since I am primarily dealing with children, where the child is comfortable and calm and will walk for me uh, is to me the ideal location. Got it. Thank you. So what about uh, the length of these meetings? You talked a little bit, Dr. Tosi, before about how this puts more of a, it's, I almost want to say administrative burden on the doctors than maybe an in-person visit. Would you say that these are, as far as like time-wise goes, are these like, would a regular sort of 30 minute or 15 minute doctor visit in an in-person setting, are those often about the same length, shorter or longer when they're doing virtual? And obviously every situ situation is different, but do you, are you finding there's a trend? I find that because you can't predict, I have to book every call as 30 minutes because we do spend a certain amount of time sometimes fiddling with the hardware um, and we need to get a consent um, from folks, we request that they review it um, before the call starts, but I would argue that less than 10% of people have actually read it, and it's our job to make sure that they understand. And, and that's particularly important because of the issues of privacy, um, which can become problematic, and also because it is not absolutely clear outside of Medicare and Medicaid what percentage of these visits are going to be covered by insurers. And so there's risk for the family and it's our duty to explain that. Um, um, so, I, and you never know when it's gonna be really, really complex. And I think the, the one thing that's wonderful pa for patients is they now expect us to be on time. I don't know any doctor, including myself, that's regularly on time. Uh, so that's the new normal too. Yeah, I would agree with Laura. I think there are a, a lot of challenges. And one is that I agree we, like, you know, since I'm, I'm using it every day or, you know, me and my colleagues, if we're having a group visit with someone, you know, we're quite good about getting on like straight away and getting things, but obviously for many patients or families, this is kind of the first time that they've used whatever application we're asking them to use. And so sometimes there are issues with kind of getting everybody on or they like can't figure out how to get their computer unmuted so that we can hear them or those sorts of things um, that maybe make the visit go longer. I would say for individuals where we need to use translation services, that that seems to take much longer over video than it does um, in person and can lengthen the visits. And then I agree, I think that one of the challenges too is that a lot of times, again, for us, we have um, trainees that are with us. And so we kind of really need to be on time because the trainee is logging on and maybe we've got a nurse or someone else logging on and I'm logging on and the patient or parent and family are logging on. And sometimes again, maybe the, you know, one parent is at work, one parent's at home with the kid. And so we, so there is this kind of increased pressure that we're all really, if we say there are appointments at 10 o'clock, that we're all really like really logging on at 10 o'clock because we're all not physically there to know. So. So I think for us, like what, what we've seen is that again, like if I have like a clinic day, and since again, as I mentioned, we're only doing about 50% in-person visits and limiting that, you know, what would have been one clinic day for me gets split into two clinic days, one clinic day that's an in-person day and one clinic day that's, that's a video day. For patients, I think it's a lot quicker, I think, um, because you know they're not having to drive into the appointment or park in a crowded parking garage, you know, get up, 
and a crowded elevator and those sorts of things. So I think the, the video visits for them are really a, a huge time saver. One of the other things that we're doing, um, because I have a vigorous bone health clinic and so many kids need DEXAs, is we've made arrangements with the hospital to do DEXAs on the weekends um, so that the, the folks can drive in when the parking lot is far less crowded, there's virtually nobody in the elevator, uh, et cetera. And so we can get six or eight of those done on a Saturday and then follow up with telemedicine visits, uh, which is very helpful because of our kids who are immunocompromised, very ill, shouldn't be in crowds. One of the other things though that um, Dr. Sutton alluded to that is really important to understand because I'm sure his hospital is like mine. We're an armed camp right now. Heaven help you if you try to bust in without permission. You can't get through without getting your temperature taken. You have to have a mask on and our toilets have never been so clean. It's wonderful. Uh, so, so I do think that most hospitals in the United States are following this. And, and so that a lot of the worries that might occur in other locations are not really such a worry in hospitals right now. Yeah, I would absolutely agree, as I mentioned earlier. So as an example, you know, we, again, not only are limiting the number of visits, um, uh, only typically if it's a child visit, only one parent is typically allowed up to, again, minimize the number of people. There are monitors at the elevators so that um, um, there aren't more than a certain number of people that allow appropriate spacing in elevators. The, as Dr. Tosi was saying, you know, temperature checks, histories, all those sorts of things. So I, I think if you, I, I would say that, you know, if you really feel like you want an in-person visit, again, I think particularly most, you know, tertiary care hospitals or probably hospitals in general are taking this seriously and they're going to be sure that they take every effort to keep you safe if you do need to come in for an in-person visit. Great, thank you. So, you had both talked a, a tiny bit about this, but can you speak more on how do you get prescriptions filled during all of this? Truth be told, my PA is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And she looks up the pharmacy and if all of that is now done electronically. Um, I haven't seen a prescription pad for a couple of years, um, but um, I'm thrilled to tell you that someone technologically more competent than me is taking care of the prescriptions and making sure they get there. Reed, are, are, are you better my, than me? My experience is the same as Laura's. I mean, everything is, elect, everything is electronic. And again, if you, um, you know, if, if you feel like you need a prescription, obviously calling your doctor and they should be able to send that electronically to your pharmacy or if you're, you know, are getting infusions and infusion center to, you know, send orders to that infusion center. Um, you know, th the other option too is, you know, the pharmacy is able to send us um, either electronically or to call us if, you know, you're calling saying like I need a refill and they say you're out of refills that they should be able to contact us as well so well, that's good to Michael hear. can mm -hmm. I push you please um, because Leslie asked a very important question which is privacy incursions and mm -hmm. that I think has been um, a concern for all of us zoom bombing etc um, I'm thrilled to say that I've never had any form of zoom bombing but one of the challenges for preserving privacy is that often you've got a divorced parent here and a divorced parent there, and none of the names are the same. And you're looking at the list of who's trying to sign in. Um, and people who are very attentive uh, with their appointments will sometimes sign in half an hour early. So I'll have two sets of parents uh, when I should only have one, um, uh, that I now also have the parents for the next call. And, and so I am 
very, very um, careful to be sure I can identify every name on the Zoom list and who they're attached to before I say anything. Um, uh, it's imperfect, uh, but, but it is one of the advantages of Zoom. I don't know about Epic. What, well, they wouldn't Zoom bomb on Epic. Um, uh, but, but we can stop immediately if there's any question of whether there's somebody on the call that doesn't uh, belong there. And, and I monitor that throughout the entire visit for just that reason. And I'm, I'm no Zoom super expert, but there, it is important for people to be mindful that there are different versions of Zoom that institutions sign on for. And so if you're you know, a healthcare provider and you're using Zoom, their use that would be a, a form of Zoom that's compliant with the federal privacy laws called HIPAA, right. um, and so it you know there it the the risk is going to be very different than you know these sort like a regular Zoom meeting where there's no password and it's the non HIPAA compliant version of Zoom as opposed to kind of what in, institution you know uh, medical institutions are compelled by federal law to, to use if they're gonna be communicating with patients. And just Leslie typed in another message. I, I think that is great. She said, so patients and families really need to have their name and not just phone number listed correctly for the sign-in. That's a, a aspirational goal because when the last names don't match, um, sometimes I'm challenged. Um, but but no one gets to talk about medical until I know who they belong to. To be belong to. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so my next question is also one that you had both touched on previously. But I was wondering if you could go in a tiny bit more detail, at least to what you know. So obviously these are going to be very specific answers to both of you, uh, but to like who pays for this and how do you pay for this and what types of fees should patients be expecting when they sign in for a telehealth visit with Dr. Sutton or Dr. Tosi? Well, I think the first thing, you know, again, to emphasize is that this is all very much a moving target that yeah. Or, you know, as, as we discussed previously in regards to kind of state licensure or those sorts of things that states have relaxed those sorts of requirements, but those are only temporary. Um, I think that in general, um, most insurers typically would follow what the Center for Medicare and Medicaid services that Dr. Tosi had mentioned in her presentation um, uh, are currently, you know, supporting um, telehealth visits, particularly video telehealth visits. Um, and so the, the, as far as kind of billing and insurance, it would typically kind of occur just as it would for an in-person visit. Um, with most insurance, again, with this sort of exception we talked about earlier is kind of telemedicine across state lines. Right. Right. I, I think it's guaranteed that Medicaid and Medicare visits will be covered. And we believe that the private insurers will step up. Um, but there are so many of them, we really don't know from day to day. I think they would face public outrage uh, if, if they didn't cover it, at least for the moment. And we've, I've certainly not had any you know, I do occasionally have patients call me saying, like, I got this bill, what's this bill? Um, um, and usually it's like, that. well, you've not met your deductible yet this year, that's what that bill is. But um, I, I've, we've not, like, I've not had or I've not heard of kind of patients getting bills for telehealth visits that their insurer kind of has refused to cover. Right. Um, thank you. So another thing I have to do about uh, the question I have is 
I, I'm curious to see, so Dr. Tosi, you'd shared that article that I had found uh, on the New Yorker talking about, you know, telemedicine and where it fits into the landscape. And you had the quote about how like the genie is out of the bottle. Um, what do you think the future of telemedicine, and again, we know you're may not experts on telemedicine policy, but you are, are both two doctors who are, I think it's safe to say experts in OI who are doing lots of telemedicine uh, in different parts of the country. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what do you think the future of this is, um, in particularly for our community. Write your congressman. And I, I'm not kidding, you know, CMS policy is ultimately um, uh, determined significantly by what Congress tells it to do. Uh, and, and I think stirring up the nation to say this is a practical solution to some things, not everything. Um, I can't do an x-ray over telemedicine. Zoom doesn't come with an x-ray machine. Um, uh, and, and I like to do range of motion of a lot of joints. Um, but, but we can do a lot. We can reduce the number of inpatient visits substantially uh, for many years if we can get this covered going forward. So please write your congressman. Right, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I agree with Laura that, you know, again, most private insurers generally are gonna follow policies from Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. So if they kind of come out with a clear policy about coverage, I think that that would be helpful, again, not just for people with Medicare and Medicaid, but for people with private insurance. Um, I, I do think, yes, it's gonna remain to be seen um, what's gonna happen with telehealth. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, there are, again, lots of things that we do actually like to see people for. And, you know, again, you know, as, as Dr. Tosi had mentioned, you know, not only are the visits taking longer, you know, at least for, for me and my patients or our clinics, we like we're having to go through all of our clinic schedules and figure out who do we feel like we need to see in person and who do we feel like, you know, we can kind of do a video visit with, knowing that we can't have everybody in person, but also we probably can't do every, like there are people that we do need to see. So then that again is kind of extra work, not only for us, but also our, our clinic staff in, in sorting that all out. Um, and again, as Dr. Tosi had mentioned, we, we thankfully at our institution, I don't have to do that initial consent. We have the schedulers doing that, but that, I know that takes them a substantial amount of time. And then, you know, we're for follow-ups, we're often booked a number of months out in advance. And so again, the those individuals are then having to flip in-person visits to help telehealth visits. So it is um, a lot more work to try to figure that out. Here, here. And there was a question um, about the fees. And frankly, I don't know if a telemedicine visit is more or less expensive uh, than a regular in-person visit. Uh, and and that, that's something I'll try to find out it's important. Yeah, and I don't know either. We at our institution, so so normally what would happen kind of at the end of the clinic visit is there's a place in our electronic health record where based upon kind of the amount of time that I spent or the complexity that I'm going to click a button that says, you know, this is the level of service that an individual got. Um, right now at our institution, all I'm doing is basically entering a code that indicates it was a telehealth visit, and that goes to our medical billing coders, and they look at what I've entered and they determine kind of what level of service um, uh, was provided. Um, so again, I don't. I my understanding was that it's supposed to be pretty similar to in in person visits um, in regards to either kind of what insurance is. Um, responsible for or what patients are responsible for. But again, I'm not directly involved in that. 
So yeah. as Dr. Tosi mentioned, she's not either. So. Um, I'm going to jump ahead, Michael, because we're running short of time. I will tell you one of the beauties of Zoom um, has been my multidisciplinary clinic, um, because now with social distancing, we can't have as many people either in the admin space or e even in the patient room. And if you've got genetics and um, and endocrinology and everybody clamoring to see the patient at the same time, it's virtually impossible uh, to maintain social distancing. So the way we have come to uh, peace with this is that I'm in the clinic and the subspecialists are all on Zoom. And so we can talk, we can share, but, but we're not risking uh, crowding. And, and so it's, it's been a, a unique and fun finding uh, that I want, would be one of the things I would hope to maintain um, since we rarely need the subspecialists uh, to, to really be doing so much patient contact as an orthopod needs to do. So um, yet another Benny of Zoom going forward. I would I would agree that I've um, so there are certain sorts of kind of visits where like it it works pretty it's worked pretty well for me to have multiple specialists on or multiple kind of healthcare providers on so particularly if it's a clinic where it's mainly kind of like let's say me and a resident and a dietitian or something that that works pretty well because we're all kind of on the same schedule. I have found it a little more challenging to try to kind of set up kind of what, again, where we would normally have a multidisciplinary clinic where let's say, you know, as Laura said, like, you know, the orthopedic surgeon would go in and then the genetics doctor would go in and then, you know, the nurse or whom nurse practitioner would go in, whomever, that that's a, that's a lot harder for us at least to kind of coordinate by video than it is in person because again what we would have to do is either kind of space out patients a whole lot so that we're kind of all on the call at the same time but then again that's very inefficient for us because you know, I'm having to sit around and listen to three other people collect information um, uh, that maybe kind of is, is not relevant to kind of what I'm doing in the participation in the group visit. So, so Dr. Sutton, this is Tracy. Sorry, Michael, to jump in here, but can a patient request that though? And what would you say to them if they said, I would like you to be there and my orthopedic surgeon? And would, is that a possibility or? It would only be possible if that's the normal structure of the clinic, I would imagine. So if you're, if someone is going to a clinic where that's the typical structure for in-person visits is that you're making one clinic appointment, but you're seeing three or four different doctors, mm -hmm. that probably would be possible by video. But if it's, you know, that, well, like normally I just go on the same day to you know, Children's National, and I see Dr. Tosi, and I see these two other doctors. Then those are going to typically be set up as separate video visits. Okay. Yeah, I can only do this on my multidisciplinary days. Got it. Um, uh, our uh, different clinics have different structure, different names, right? Uh, and we work around it. And can I ask one more question, Michael? I'm sorry for both of them because I know we're getting toward the end. Are your, your, your nurse or the billing people, they, they all know who is coming? Is that how it is? And you just give that information to them? Or how, is it just like a normal, it would just be like a normal visit when you came into the office? Like the admin part, is it the same? There's actually a lot less admin part for us. Again, there's, there's the consent that gets done beforehand and of course the scheduling the visit. But for us, like, you know, normally, like not only are you scheduling, but then you come in and you check in at the front desk and they maybe make a copy of your 
insurance card and give you a little form to fill out and then you've got to get your vital signs and then wait for a room you know that most all of that goes is is going away so it is again con as i was mentioning earlier for patients the visit almost certainly is like hugely shorter and not even just the time it takes for you to get from your house to the parking garage but then all the multiple steps from the parking garage again for us have pretty or pretty much reduced all that stuff is condensed into that initial kind of scheduling of the video visit where all that stuff in regards to consent or you know getting insurance happens over the phone great thank you now, i have a list um and and um it's it's all pre-programmed basically the parents know when they're supposed to sign in I know who I'm looking for based on my list, and I try to only admit the appropriate individuals, as we spoke about earlier, into first the waiting room and then into the Zoom call. Thank you. Great. Back Thank to you, you Michael. <laughs> no, um, so I wanted to ask, uh, so if we have any other questions from the audience, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, this is your time with Dr. Sutton and Dr. Tosi. I would say we have time for probably one more question. Michael, there's one more call, question on the chat box that I don't know the name, uh, the answer to it, but I think um, Reed might. Um, we don't have fellows. So it says, I'm not sure if I'm getting a second bill from the fellow. Both of them were on the telemedicine call. You don't have the fellows bill as well as you do you they're not able they're right so only the attending visit yeah. well yes only the attending physician as far as physician bills only the attending physician is going to be able to bill and so it, and that's not different than when you go in so if you go in you know and you, there's you know an orthopedic you know you go in to see dr tosi and she's got an orthopedic surgery resident with her for the day that resident is you know, helping Dr. Tosi, but Dr. Tosi is the one that, only one that's able to bill for that visit. Now, if there are kind of ancillary people, again, like let's say a dietitian maybe that would bill or like a physical therapist um, on the call, again, those individuals are separate providers typically from the physician and so they, they may bill, but as far as like trainees go, in, in general, they're not able to bill for appointments. Got it, thank you so much. Um, I wanna apologize to everyone for the sound quality. It is beginning to thunderstorm by my apartment and I can barely hear myself talk. Um, Dr. Tosi, I imagine you might be hearing the same things now. It's uh, actually already passed. Oh, and really? Okay, huge. it's like, it's like 10 minutes ago. Yeah. And it's like clear now. I know. So you'll so, be clear soon. Okay, good to know. Um, so anyway, uh, with that being said, uh, now that we're talking about the weather, um, I want to thank everyone for joining this call today. I think we all learned a lot. Yeah. I want to really thank Dr. Reed Sutton, Dr. Laura Tosi for lending us their time this evening, talking to us about telemedicine, maybe the future of medicine, question mark. Um, but uh, this was extremely informative, extremely helpful. Thank you both so much. Our pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Yes, absolutely our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. And again, if you have any questions for the OI Foundation or for the doctors, you can email us at bonelink.org. That's bonelink, oh, sorry, bonelink at oif.org. Oh, I'm kidding. Um, it's been a long day. Uh, anyway, I will see you all uh, hopefully soon and uh, be well. Thank you all. Great. Bye, stay safe. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay safe.